Hello and welcome to End Goals, an LCMS Youth Ministry Podcast. I'm host Reverend Mark Kiesling and I'm with DCE Juliana Schultz. We are here to bring parents, church workers, and lay leaders discussions and resources to help your youth ministry meet its end goal, which is young people who are disciples of Jesus Christ for life. Today, we are kicking off a new series where we talk about different contexts and how they can impact your youth ministry. Every congregation has something that makes them unique. It could be an interesting history, a distinct neighborhood, traditions that impact young people, or just the people themselves. I think that's one of the great joys we have in in our work is being able to go to lots of different congregations and see just how different every single one of them is. I mean, no two congregations are alike, and that's the same for youth ministry. No two youth ministries are exactly alike. So as we uh, start this series about context, Mark, I'm curious, how would you describe the context of your church growing up. We've talked about this a little bit. In the past. Yeah, like I, would, I definitely go with the characteristics of rural uh, for sure. Uh, lower on the social economic status in terms of just the area that we lived in and, and our congregation as well. So in terms of looking at resources, but yet still very faithful, great stewards um, in that sense. I would say very much um, um, hardworking um, in terms of there weren't a lot of maybe safety nets in the situation. There uh, was a lot of... Um, Maybe we didn't see a lot of multi-generational families in our congregation that maybe you'd see in other places. And then too, just in general too, even though rural, not even highly Christianized um, uh, and especially not Lutheran, uh, but yet nonetheless still had a great strong congregation and friends that were a part of that. But when I looked at my overall friends and things, when I think about my congregational context, there were those uh, parts of my culture certainly growing up. How about how about you? What would you use? Yeah, um, grew up in uh, Topeka, Kansas, which is a small city. Uh, it's not a huge urban <laughs> multi air or uh, not a huge urban area for sure, uh, but but solidly you know, middle class attached to uh, a Lutheran school that we shared amongst uh, as an association mm-hmm. school association about six different churches um, that I uh, that I grew up in a uh, bigger mm-hmm. church definitely I mean had multiple staff people including multiple DCEs and um, so had a very big youth group uh, mm-hmm. as a part of my youth ministry uh, and uh, but also like you talked about not uh, not as Christian in your community there were eight to ten churches within like kind of a six block radius. <laughs> yes. Right? I've, been in, so, I've been in your neighborhood of your home church. Yes, that would describe um, it well. A church behind us and a church across <laughs> the street from us and a church three blocks down and a church another three blocks the other direction. So um, they have big weddings, don't a couple churches share parking yes, lots and things like that, I think. Parking lots, definitely. <laughs> um, and, um, and so I definitely had that experience of, of – Many of the the people in our area looking very much alike, very much having that pattern of of being a part of a church community. Uh, I'm sure that's different now but, yeah. uh, in some ways, uh, but definitely had a, a pretty um, insular, very, very, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe even go so far as to say kind of monochromatic <laughs> Yeah. Of, of of context growing up, but a, a really lovely one and, and huge support for youth ministry, um, fantastic history of youth ministry um, that had gone back a, a long, long time. Um, so that's uh, it was great to to grow up in that context and and probably everyone who's listening could could talk about what that looked like either in their home congregation growing up or in, in their congregation now. One of the things we know is that there are context pieces about your church, your neighborhood, and your teens that will impact how you choose to practice healthy youth ministry. When we did our research, there were differences that we could see depending on the context of the church. This tells us that understanding and responding to these differences can make an impact in meeting that end goal of young people who are disciples for life. And we want to be clear from the very, very beginning of this that we are not talking about changing the gospel, right? Regardless of your context, God's word is the same. And the context doesn't change who God is or what God has done. We want all youth ministry, regardless of context, to really rest firmly on Jesus' death and resurrection. And so when we talk about changes according to context, we are talking about shifting teaching styles and examples, adjusting programming, and thinking differently about parents and supportive adults. These things can be tweaked or adjusted to better meet young people and their families where they are. 
So as we think about context, we have to be reminded that what works in one youth ministry doesn't necessarily work Mm -hmm. in another. Mm -hmm. Often I'll get that question of like, well, here's a little bit about the situation in my church. What would you do? And I kind of go like, oh, no, (laughs) I don't have nearly (laughs) enough information for that, right? Um, Because it's not as though the knowledge, uh, even of youth ministry broadly, is enough to be able to know what will work well in one church or another. And that's a lot of why seven practices is descriptive and not prescriptive. It's not a program, but practices that are going to look different in every youth ministry. Yeah, one of the struggles I think I saw along that line of looking at general youth ministry books um, is often that they were maybe describing a youth ministry that was dramatically different of the one that maybe a lot of our LCMS congregations find themselves in. I don't know any thought on that. Did you see that too, Juliana, when you were looking at other resources? Yeah, I mean, just that they they were talking about you know games that required a lot more teenagers than I had in my group, or um, elaborate supplies that were well outside of my budget, or um, talked a lot of focus on um, in worship. Oh, yeah. sometimes Um, and and set apart worship, like like that. There's there's a youth only worship service. Which is really not at all the context where yeah. most of our, our youth ministries are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we look at those resources and we kind of go like, hey, that doesn't seem to uh, to apply to you know, what we hope to do. And it, it makes it hard to translate that, those kinds of things. Yeah, I, th- I think one time I see in some resources that, I mean, it, it is though they have 10 staff members working just on senior high <laughs> youth ministry. And it's like, I don't know how, uh, that's not the context for a lot of congregations that are doing very effective youth ministry. Right, um, and doing and so it like, with volunteers. Do it with volunteers, right? And it's because those relationships that get built and those relationships can get built without full-time staff people, or like you said, the resources for doing some of these other, where there might be activities. And so that's where we really wanted to get into the individual context, especially those that fit LCMS churches, maybe more, uh, where it is so many um, just dedicated uh, part-time or volunteer workers, or they're wearing multiple hats. Um, And so how do you best uh, bring the community together to support young people in their day in, day out, week in, week out ministry? Yeah, because one of the things we hope the series will help you to do is not only think about your context, but to maybe step a little bit away from that comparison game and have a new appreciation for what's true in your unique ministry. Um, Because often I think we're focused on what God is doing in other churches. Um, We just finished the National Lutheran Youth Workers Conference. And and while we don't emphasize that, I think it's kind of that natural thing that happens. Well, like, tell me what's going on in your your youth ministry. And then all of a sudden I'm I'm comparing what what God's doing over there to what God's doing in my church. And um, that can lead us down some really dangerous paths. Mm -hmm. Um, And we lose focus on what God doing right in front of us. And so we hope in thinking about context and unique situations and how you think about those things um, can help you to appreciate and thank God for the work he's doing with your teens and your youth ministry, rather than worrying about, are you measuring up to some imaginary right. standard of somebody right. else in another place with other groups of teens and doing other things? Yeah, really gives that focus to, again, those young people that are right there before you and that God's brought into your church for the waters of baptism, relationships that connect families and all those things and uh, allow us to refocus and re- re-energize on those uh, young people that we've gotten to know and love for sure. So there's going to be kind of two areas we want to look at as we're thinking about context. And the first is, um, how do you understand your community uh, context? So this is kind of your neighborhood and the people around you. Um, Some kind of you heard Mark and I talk about kind of the the areas that our churches were located in, Uh, and kind of the first steps in looking at that, if you're wanting to know more about your community, would be to look at some of the broad based data that's available to you. So you can now look at your census data. (laughs) Right? <laughs> if you're a, if you're a data nerd like me, you'll get very excited and very um, into the census data. Or if not, then um, there are some other tools that you can use. Like you connect with LCEF can connect you with something called Mission Insight, which provides data um, on and breaks down the kinds of people who are in your neighborhood. Um, and this will give you a lot of broad data. Now, it's not going to give you a full picture. It's kind of like looking at generational data <laughs> in that it's going to give you a big picture view, but a starting point, but not necessarily a lot of the nuance. And, and I think something that can be helpful too, if you can get your hands on historical data, it can help you understand like maybe when your church was planted, this was what was happening when it happened. This is what's changed over the time if there, if you are in a changing location. So it kind of gives you a little bit of that history of what the community around you has made the changes they've gone through over the years as well. 
I was really lucky when I was researching in my neighborhood in Chicago that somebody had written a local history book and it, they had actually referenced our church and school because it was the first one that was built in the area. And so wow. um, like you were able to see that all the way back, like how that relationship with the community was initially built um, mm-hmm. and the value they had put in it and then like how that had continued over time. And it's also great to be able to get out and walk around your neighborhood or your community, if that's possible. Um, Take your youth with you. (laughs) Uh, Mm -hmm. Do a prayer walk and find some key points you want to navigate around your neighborhood. Walk. And as you do, look at the spaces and the people around you. So look for what you do see and a lot of what you don't see. Um, And what can you learn about the areas around your church looking just specifically for um, what's going on in your neighborhood? Mm -hmm. And see along those ways that you get to know possibly some of the people in your neighborhood too. Here's some of the things, concerns maybe they have, ways that uh, churches can serve in neighborhoods and also build those relationships. Another thing too, just talking about the youth themselves is to know your teens, high schools, and the systems that are in it as well, and how that maybe affects everything from uh, the politics to the boundaries that are in your area, the discussions that take place, how kids and families maybe get brought up into that. Um, and you kind of can kind of understand how your ministry might be spread out uh, beyond your neighborhood um, and how people are into their schools and school districts is sometimes this can make it more difficult uh, to make schedules work um, and other things, but at least you start to get that understanding um, of how your youth uh, is connecting with their school and give insight into their communities as well. And you kind of maybe uh, schools have reputations or whatever it might be, and that can help you allow to have conversations and, and bring unity in your congregation around kids going to different schools. And they might be in a lot of different schools or they might be just a few. Uh, I know for me in Chicago, I had to learn um, all the differences between things like uh, international baccalaureate, IB schools and magnet schools. Yeah. And um, there we still had um, spots where there were um, got girls only schools, guys only schools, um, you know, or maybe you're in a place where you have a high school and it serves three or four different towns right. serves the whole county, right? right? right. Um, it gives, helps give you a sense of the places where your young people are spending a lot of their time. Uh, and as you know, we talked about good community youth ministry in previous podcasts. Um, we can encourage you to go meet with your leadership of your local high school if that's possible. Um, now, if you have 20 different high schools represented, maybe not that many, but, <laughs> but, uh, but if there is really kind of a singular high school, can you connect with somebody as a leader in there and hear more about what's going on in the school and how you can partner with them. And doing that too, of course, again, this is easier if you have maybe fewer schools or school districts uh, that you're working with. But then the next part too is actually be at activities uh, for your students, uh, whether it's sports, music, performance, whatever it might be. And if it's not, maybe you, um, how do you help others, maybe supportive adults be a part of that? Again, just another way to extend the care of the church um, and let young people know you care about them and their gifts and are supporting them and the things that uh, they have interest in and the, where their skills are at be another great positive way that you can reinforce your care for young people. And they're going to give you a great insight into kind of what the people in your community are passionate about, um, the kinds of people that are in your community um, that are interacting with your young people. Uh, And that can help you understand, uh, especially as you're thinking about like how you're connecting your lessons to their everyday lives as you're you're looking to help figure out how Jesus is working in their vocations. Seeing them and getting to observe them living out those vocations is a great way for you to think about how you can um, direct... uh, education or your Bible studies or your devotions to things that they're hearing, uh, the pressures that they have, the people they interact with outside of your church. So then the other places that we can look at are not just your community context, but your specific congregational context. So as you look at your congregation, maybe you're going to start by looking at the history. So what uh, is the history of your church? Is it hundreds of years old? No, maybe not hundreds, plural. I don't think we have any churches quite that old. Uh, right, close, close. Um, or is it is it new? What does youth ministry look like in the past? Um, how has the congregation found success? Where has it struggled? What kind of leaders have been involved? How did they impact ministry? Because uh, that history can tell you a lot. It can tell you a lot uh, of information of, that can help you make good decisions and wise decisions based on previous information. Uh, it can tell you where there's some pain points maybe mm-hmm. that are still lingering, but it can also give you some places where uh, there might be huge potential uh, for you and your youth ministry. Depending on the, the history of your congregation to it, how long um, 
it's been doing ministry is that there's even to see how maybe the church responded to uh, external affair, uh, factors too in your either meeting community or also outside. So if you're in a congregation that's been around for about a hundred years, how did they react to something like World War II, to uh, yeah. Vietnam War, to the changes uh, that happened in the 60s, to um, you know things of baby booms that happen maybe throughout your congregations. Uh, so it kind of gives you an idea too of, oh, be able to really tell a history that as your congregation faces new things and new challenges and new opportunities, you can look back into your history and say like, hey, this is how the faithful members of this church did it 50, 60 years ago. Uh, we want to follow in their footsteps or these are things we learned through that as well. And so it can really continue to tell the story of what God is doing in that place uh, through the congregation. We did this as uh, as our congregation. We looked at some history um, real recently in a leadership retreat, and I was um, really impressed by just how much the history of the church had impacted kind of the values mm -hmm. that were held up in, in it um, and how it had developed the community of people around us. So uh, I, I think you know, we don't want to always be looking backwards or being like, well, we've, we've never done it that way before, <laughs> or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we tried it once it didn't work. That's not necessarily what we're looking for, but, but really just where are the spots where we can learn a lot about the, the place that we are um, to help us do more effective youth ministry. And along with that, looking at, uh, at our resources, um, looking at the, the things that we would like to do, but also that can be limited uh, by resources. Everybody's going to have limitations to those resources. And then not necessarily that you need to be stopped by that, but be aware of, of what's available to you um, or what you need in order to, to do that. But really powerful ministry can be done without a lot of time um, or money, really. Yep. And then bring it into that focus is certainly ask your teens, um, ask them questions, uh, allow them to respond and give input to maybe some decisions. Uh, you know, we talk about things where we are so pleasantly surprised by reaction from young people at the 19 youth gathering. Uh, we had our, in our youth booth, a place where we asked for descriptions, um, of their church. We, weren't sure what kind of reactions we would get, but so many of them said very positive things. Um, and what they said were negative might've particularly been helpful for uh, their youth ministry to address. And so if those things could be said back to the leadership, it can engage into a nice conversation about, okay, we, we missed that. Let's, let's change that. Let's fix that. Let's have a deeper conversation about why you feel that way. Um, and it could be not just good for the youth ministry, but ministry in general, um, just so it allows for, again, that back and forth to happen with church leadership, whether that's, again, the staff or those that are in uh, lay leadership to be able to be aware. And because we're investing in young people and we appreciate what they say, it really engages into a nice conversation around ministry and, and how we're reaching out into our communities as well as strengthening the faithful there at the church itself. So as we go through this series, we're going to be talking about a couple of different aspects of context. We're going to have some where we're going to be talking about how the the community, whether it's rural or small town, whether it's urban, and how that plays into your context. But we're also going to talk about how size in particular, so large congregations or small congregations, so that internal um, context and how that plays out in youth ministry. Uh, at, and, and we're not going to be able to hit everything um, because otherwise that would be the only theme this podcast would talk uh, about for the next uh -huh. uh, year was all the potential different contexts. Um, recognizing that as we kind of look through some of the key ones, we're going to find that different contexts have different challenges. Right. So I've met with youth leaders, um, particularly those working in, say, like urban or inner city environments. They've dealt with challenges around gun violence or monetary poverty in ways that maybe are, are different than those who are out in the suburbs. And then we have larger churches that are going to struggle um, to find enough supportive adults. Right. Uh, when you have a, a youth group of over 100, how do you make sure there's five supportive adults for every young person? Right. Um, it becomes a whole different challenge. Or, you know, we had an, a, an affinity group back at the 19 gathering that talked about churches near military bases. And had, yeah. I had never really even thought about how that might change the, the culture in your church to have a challenge of like just like a high turnover of young people that happens all the time. Um, so, you know, there are definitely different challenges in different contexts that, that are worth talking about. Yeah. And then even, I mean, like you were talking about the personality of the church too, or the history that's there, but even sometimes churches in very different contexts 
can then have similar opportunities and challenges too, just based off of maybe history, the of the pastoral leadership, or um, just where they put resources and put focus too. So there's can be some some cool connections you can see contextually too that based off of maybe some history components that will link congregations that they can be resources to one another and support of one another, which is always awesome too across a church body. Yeah. And there's plenty of uh, ways where different contexts can bring different benefits too, right? So, you know, in our research, we were able to look at and see just how strong those relational connections are, particularly in in rural and small town churches where they were able to track their youth and the young adults much better over time, partly because they were able to be a part of a network of people in their community, mm-hmm. right. <laughs> um, you know, multi-generations, and, and they were able to maybe track that a little bit better, uh, but, but maybe found that uh, young people stayed around less in their yeah small town, whereas uh, you know, larger churches seem to have uh, a little bit better retention being in closer to urban areas. Um, we found that schools with Lutheran, our churches with Lutheran schools were able to retain uh, more young people than maybe th- others through high, through high school at least. So um, we want you to be able to think about how you're leaning into your strengths as well as thinking about your challenges, but how mm-hmm. can you use some of those to your advantage in sharing the gospel with young people? So over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to talk to practitioners doing ministry in a variety of contexts. So like I said, rural and small town, urban, suburban, large, small. And we hope that you'll not only listen to episodes that apply to your context, but also to the others. Um, Even if what you hear might not apply to you directly, uh, you may be able to better help support and connect with other youth leaders in those communities. If nothing else, we want you to be in prayer for each other. One of the biggest takeaways from the National Lutheran Youth Workers Conference was just how many people are passionate about youth ministry in their congregations. They want young people to love the Lord and to grow deeper in relationship with Him. And they see, again, people as being vital and vitally important. That as we share the gospel with one another and support our young people through uh, sometimes difficult situations, but great uh, joy-filled situations as well. So we hope this is one way you see other youth leaders that are out there and that you pray for them and that you find ways to support each other. So a couple of questions to close. How would you characterize the community around your church? Or how about the community where your young people live every day? How would you characterize your congregation? How does that impact your youth ministry, positively or negatively? And what do you hope to hear that might be helpful in navigating your youth ministry context in this series? And that question might just pop up on our social media for you to respond to. (laughs) Um, We will continue to keep you in our prayers as you care for young people exactly where God has placed you. You are not where you are by accident. God has gifted you gifts and skills to live out your vocations, including as youth leader, exactly where you are. So in your failures and in your successes, we know God is working powerfully through you. NGOL's podcast is a production of LCMS Youth Ministry and KFUO Radio. To find out more about LCMS Youth Ministry or to find links to resources mentioned, go to kfuo.org slash youth ministry. Thank you for listening and caring for the young people of our church.